Well, good morning, church. Let's sing together. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns, O oh, music but its own.
from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, my life, you have been faithful. Oh, my life, you have been so, so. the goodness of God I love your voice you have led me through the fire in darkest nights you are close like no other I've known you as a father known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God Oh my life you have been faithful Oh my life you have been so so good with every breath that I the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. My life laid down, I'm surrendered now, I give you Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Oh, my life, you have been faithful. Oh, my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able. I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. Yes, Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you that you choose to love us, that you choose to bring us into relationship with you, mm-hmm. that you seek us out that your goodness and your mercy follows us. Thank you for who you are, Lord. I pray that you'd be among us today in all the distant places, all the places that were spread out, um, that you would fill each home and fill each heart simply with the knowledge of your goodness and of your love. Be among us today, Lord. In Jesus' name. We have uh, a video, so let's watch that. Okay, well, hello. I know this is a little bit funny. Here we are having an interview to an empty room, (laughs) but in theory, there will be lots of people on the other side of this that get to see and join us in learning a little bit more about your story and who you are. I want to go on the record as saying I'm honored uh, that you're here joining us and to hear your story more. And um, thank you. I think it's very brave of you to be here and how lovely that you have brought a little friend. (laughs) He's gracious gracious with a cute yawn. Thank you. Uh, Okay, so why don't you start by telling us your first name and then some about your story? Um, My name is Rachel Nabifo. I'm 24 years old. I'm a Ugandan. I came to, I immigrated to Canada as a refugee. And um, I, came, I, I am a, I'm a single mom um, who, is, who is trying so hard to 
look f- to, to get, get a, a better, better future, future for my daughter. Yeah. Amen. Um, well, I I say amen because I have been invested in your story from the sidelines yes. and kind of cheering for you guys, and and also wanting the best uh, future possible to for doors to be opened and for you to get the things that you need. Could you share some of the some of the fears that that you had in being a new mom in a new place? Um, what were some of the concerns that you had and maybe still have? You know, like, What are some of the big things that make for stress or fear? Okay, some of the things is like, um, like back then, in, um, back then it was like finding a place where to stay, raising a kid and um, because back in our country we have like relatives, people to take care of your child. But this, but when you're in a foreign country, you are alone and um, you have to find a way out how to take care of your child, do everything. And on top of that, most of the time you can't work because you have to be, stay at home and be with your child. So these are things that are affecting me and still they are affecting me a lot because I don't know what I'm going to do. And being that right now I have a chance <clears throat> I have a chance that I'm staying with a host family which is hosting me right now but after here I don't know where I'm going to go well so I'm going to back up a little bit um, that's good I, I thank you for sharing yeah. how did you hear about safe families and begin to be involved um Coming to get connected to self families, um, at first I was staying at the shelter um, with uh, Pastor Joseph from Stepstone. So I was counsel. I was. I had a counselor. She was called Miss Linda. She's called Miss Linda Rosette from First Option, First Place Option. Um, she's the one who connected me to self families because at that time it was close to my due date, my due month, and. <coughs> I had no place where to go and being at the shelter whereby there are many people they won't allow you to raise a kid from there because it seems like it's not comfortable being with a kid at the shelter where there are both men and women so um the people at the shelter they were they were like now what are we going to do and when i decided to talk to miss linda i told her that um now i don't know what um what's next so she said, oh, I have a friend, um, she's called Miss Kim, she's from Safe Families, and she, de- she, she described who Safe Family were, she's like, they help people, they help children, they help single moms, they can provide you with everything. Yeah, so when she connected me to her, I talked to Miss Kim, and I explained my story, what I'm going through, and Miss Kim was here, yeah, we can help you. And immediately after my my giving birth in September, that same week, she came and was like, we found a family for you, which was so good. What's something that you appreciate most about Safe Families? I appreciate the love and the care and the support that they give me. Yes. Amen. Thank you. Well, Rachel, is there is there anything else that you want people to know about, say, families or about your story or anything that you would want to say to people? Okay, I would like to tell people who are outside there that, um, like, I, I would like to recommend people to, to join Self Families because Self Families is so good. It helps people. It creates good connection and it brings up someone's it builds up someone's future for tomorrow yeah well I know that part of how our church is trying to be involved with safe families is to be able to provide what we call a circle of support where in addition to a host family that we are able to come alongside um, folks like yourself to try to play some kind of part in helping to to find those uh, answers and those places and so we we are committed to continuing to walk with you we're we're proud of how how you've been doing uh, I wish you well. 
yeah thank you it's so it's so good yeah like being close to people and people who love you and care about you it's so good yeah but most of the time still if you're not settled in a place you always have more questions about your like thinking about ahead of yourself like how am i going to be how how, how everything is going to happen yeah but for now as and a little period i've been with self families it's so good and i encourage more i encourage more families to 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 get part of it because helping like like god helps through people giving like if you help then god will help you um somehow you never know but that will be a miracle for you because you've helped someone like me i always pray b- blessings for my for my family i always pray that god blesses them gives them a good heart that they have yeah well that's great um well um we're going to turn off the camera but then i'm going to pray for you Amen. And we'll continue on. Thank you for sharing. Well, that's great. Uh, if you would like more information on that, uh, feel free to email info at Celebration Church. Um, let's continue to sing together. I need the every hour most gracious Lord, no tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to Thee. I need Thee every hour. Stay Thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when Thou art nigh. I need thee, oh, I need thee, every hour I need thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to Thank you for saying 
the ransom from heaven Jesus Messiah Lord of all His body the bread His blood the Thank you that that is the truth, that you are Lord over all. Come and be Lord in our lives. Mm -hmm. Come be with Jason as he uh, brings the word to us. That we, we might experience your presence, your love, be inspired by your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. I think we're close. There we go. Well, good morning, or whatever time it might be that you're watching this. Um, we are in week two in terms of our teaching time uh, in our in our worship services. Uh, week two of this very small book in the New Testament called Philemon, and it's called that because it's literally a letter to an individual named Philemon. 
and that is uh, as the kind of the, the head of the household. He's, he's the target of this message from the Apostle Paul. And uh, there are a number of things that are relevant about this one chapter, short, uh, different book. It's the shortest of Paul's letters. There's a number of things about it that, are, that make it kind of unique. And so it becomes kind of a, I don't know, one of the things that I really appreciate about the Bible in that something so seemingly small and dated can carry such weight uh, for us today. Um, and so here's how I think we'll kind of outline our time. Uh, we'll go through just a brief recap and then kind of settle on to some foundational questions that I think can help us use Philemon uh, less like um, less like a, a, a place to kind of sit down in, so a little bit less like a, like a landing zone like we normally would do as we work through uh, the, a, a given passage of the Bible. Um, we will do that. We did that last week and we'll continue to do so. But this week, I hope more than a landing zone, it'll be a little bit more of a launching uh, pad uh, for, for exploring some truths related to reconciliation and division, what that looks like first culturally, uh, and personally, and, and to see what God has to say about that. So that's a little bit about where we're headed. Um, but so to, for the brief recap portion, so I mentioned Paul is the author. He's writing from prison. He's writing to a particular family and, and the, who are also his friends. And that's important as you read the letter and kind of understand some of the familial, some of the, the friendly vibes that, uh, that, that are, are written of and the way that Paul speaks, you, you can get a real sense of his heart. That he's, writing, he's writing to his friends, and that is an important thing to consider as we, as we try to interpret and then apply uh, God's Word in this way. It is also written to the church that meets in their house. If you happen to be following along, you'll see right at the introduction of the letter, it is, uh, it is penned that it is also to the church that meets in Philemon's house. That means that Philemon's family was well-to-do enough that they could host Paul when he has been traveling and that they could provide aid as, as they're thanked for. Uh, they've, they've helped provide out of their means for many people, uh, and, and particularly as it has, has afforded the spread of the good news of Jesus. And then they host a church in their home. And so that gives us some further insight uh, to the influence of the family, uh, to the occasion for the writing, which is that there's this guy named Onesimus who was a servant. He was a, a, an indentured slave to Philemon. This was super common practice back then, especially for the wealthier families. They would have had a lot of servants in their uh, employment or that were, um, that, were, that were stuck with them. And so that is affords us uh, another layer of interpretation where we get to see some of how the gospel interacts with uh, institutions like slavery that we know now uh, that, that they are that they're wrong. And the Bible doesn't say that they're right, um, but the way that the Bible interacts with these institutions gives us some really good principles how it is that we know that the Bible doesn't support these things and actually is pointing to something uh, very much better. So this occasion now, we have Onesimus, who was a slave in the household of Philemon, who has wronged them in somehow, uh, in some way rather. Somehow, Onesimus has, ha has offended the Philemon and or his household and or the church that meets there. And we don't know why, but whatever it was caused Onesimus to skip town. And um, it, it could be that he stole something, uh, but whatever it was, uh, he has now met Paul. He has become a follower of Jesus. He has now submitted his life to Jesus's way. And he is in part of his being transformed kind of like uh, uh, the language that we use a lot around here as see, be, give, go. Paul and Paul's ministry has helped Onesimus see who Jesus is. And then in his receiving Jesus, Onesimus is now becoming like Jesus. He's being transformed, and part of that transformation is to seek reconciliation with Philemon and his household. And so Paul is writing to this end to help um, to help bring reconciliation so that both parties can step out this 
uh, th- this coming together in a new reality where, where slave and master is no longer the, the, the reality governing their relationship, but instead that it would be defined by Jesus and his gospel. So that, that's about where we will stop our recap for the book uh, for now. And I will tell you that part of why I felt it appropriate to study this book of Philemon uh, presently is that our world is so obviously in such desperate need for reconciliation. In our, in our fearful cancel culture, we need some things. In the face of, of, of pride, in the face of fear, in the face of unknown and, and ignorance in some ways, uh, we, we need a better understanding of what is reconciliation. What do we mean by that? What, what can be? Many times I think that we, our culture has gotten to a point where many can't even conceive of reconciliation in most instances, in most occasions for division. So we need a better understanding of what is reconciliation. We need also a functional understanding of the difference between what Christians might call a big R reconciliation and a little r reconciliation. Let me, let me just make clear this distinction. Uh, one of the most well-known passages for uh, what we could call big R reconciliation, I think we have on uh, some slides for you. And it's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and this is talking about the reconciliation that happens between God, who is perfect, and humanity, who is not. And so, just like you can't just walk up to the highest office in your company or the highest office in your country. You can't just walk in and get an audience with those folks because there's a level of separation. And with God, that level of separation is infinite. He's infinitely perfect, infinitely beautiful, infinitely loving, and we are imperfect in all of those things. And so there's a gap that cannot be reconciled without something miraculous. So big R reconciliation is talking about the bridging of that gap between humanity and God. And that's what Paul, the same author who wrote Philemon, that's what he pins here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to read this. Many of you it will be familiar to, but we're going to do it anyway because it is rich and wonderful and we need the reminder. Therefore, if anyone <clears throat> is in Christ, that's Jesus, he is a new creation. She is a new creation. The old has passed away and behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. You see how there's sort of two things going on here. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. So big R reconciliation that happens through his people. He uses us as instruments, as ambassadors for this big R reconciliation. And so he says, we implore you on behalf of Christ Be reconciled to God. For our sake, and he's just kind of a a great summary verse here for this reconciliation. He says, for our sake, God made Jesus to be sin, to take on sin fully, who knew no sin. Jesus did not sin himself. He was perfect. But he took it on so that in Jesus we might become the righteousness of God. That's the big R. That's the big R reconciliation that is undergirding everything else that we will be talking about. 
And then the little r reconciliation is, is, the, is the being peacemakers. Matthew 5, 9 says, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God. And some of that is, is that we are happiest in God when we are joining him in his mission as peacemakers. And that's, that's more, has more of a relational, more of a horizontal uh, tone to it versus the big R vertical reconciliation. Mark 9.50 says, Jesus says, salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Again, it's talking more about this horizontal relationship. So this is what we're talking about when we, when we talk about the, the little r reconciliation. So in our discussions of Philemon, we're talking about both and how they connect to one another. Because as I said, in this fearful, prideful, cancel culture, we need big r reconciliation for our souls. We need little r reconciliation for our relationships. We need tools, particularly those of us who are Christians, who who we understand the big R. We then need some tools to uh, to be able to go about the business of the little R. We can be persons of peace. And so I think bottom line, I mean, if we're gonna get super practical, we need some help just having better conversations. I don't know about you, but between Twitter wars and questions that may or may not be questions and inferences and stonewalling and arguments from silence and you name it, we're just, we're not very good at having productive conversations. So this week, as I said, I hope that Philemon will be uh, not necessarily that landing zone where we dig deep into that, but rather through other biblical context that this relationship between Paul and Onesimus and Philemon uh, can be more of a, a, a launching point for us to explore uh, some good truth. So let's do that. Uh, we are going to do that primarily through looking at the book of Colossians, which is another letter that Paul wrote. And it's really, really valuable because Philemon and his family would have been in the greater uh, community of Colossians. They lived uh, in and around the city of Colossae, so the letter to the Colossian church, it would, would encompass many of the things uh, that, the, that Philemon would, would just be part of Philemon's world, that their church would have been grappling with, that they would have been encouraged by. They would have most certainly gotten the circulation of the letter to the Colossians because the same uh, fella is mentioned who is helping circulate it and minister. Epaphras comes up in a number of times, and also the person who we think is either Philemon's son or likely a household manager, or, or both in some sense, is mentioned in both letters. So there's a lot of overlap here, and I think it is worthwhile to, to, to read them uh, with some nice kind of dovetailing of truth. So to, do, to, get, to get us moving uh, along further, we're going to settle a couple of foundational questions uh, to set up our understanding of reconciliation, uh, mostly with a little r, uh, to be quite frank, today, uh, in how it draws from the big R reconciliation. So we're going to ask where, first we're going to ask where is unity found? Because if there's going to be reconciliation, there's got to be some kind of overarching unity that is on the other side of schism, of division, uh, of hurt, of offense, that, that kind of is driving the whole thing. Where does the hope for unity come from? Well, in part, it comes from what we just read from 2 Corinthians with the big R, reconciliation, uh, and and how that makes us ambassadors for it. But we also see that come up explicitly in Colossians. This is part of how we know that this is such a big deal to Paul, and that this is such a big driving force for the early church. So, if you would, look with me um, in Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to see how it is, let's see, I've got this in a different spot to read. We'll see how it is uh, that unity is found. We'll kind of, we, we want to be clear on what causes the unity that for Paul is driving these conversations about reconciliation, both with Philemon and then through principle to us and all the other little r 
reconciliations. So this is Colossians chapter 1, uh, verse 20. Sorry, starting verse 15, rather. Paul is addressing this letter, and then he just pauses and gives one of the the greatest um, uh, heavenly-looking declarations of, of, of our unity in Jesus. And he says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He is the representative whole of all of God. The image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or uh, or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from among the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Preeminent, all this stuff is just zeroing in on the the glory, the magnificence, the superlative nature of Jesus. Verse 19 says, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile, there's the word again, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So that, that friends, that's the, that's the foundation of the unity. It is centered on Jesus. I know that it's, sometimes it's a, a joke in Christian circles about the the uh, Jesus being kind of the magic answer. Uh, we used to joke when when I was younger in church, we called it the J bomb um, instead of other bomb words that you might drop. Uh, we, the the J bomb just, just sort of works. You just throw it in there, right, and, and then hope it makes everything okay. Well, the reason for that being a sarcastic joke is that there's some truth in it, and that's the way sarcasm works. It's that Fundamentally, Jesus is the image of God, the fullness of God who is pleased to dwell in him and all things come from him and for him and are unto him. So he is the answer. He is the foundation for the unity. He is the one, the bringer of reconciliation and of peace. And we can't, we can't move too far from that. As if we do, we lose a base for what can center us. And more on that uh, to come. So that's where unity is found. Uh, So let's ask briefly, what causes division? And so if you were here in person, I would would ask some people to to tell me what what sorts of things feel like they cause division. And we would try to work up to maybe some parent categories of what causes division. But since I can't do that, I'll just give you, uh, well, just two, lots, lots of things could be said, but I'll give you kind of two parent categories that, for me, are, are the source of most division. First one is some kind of offense, an offense. And what I mean by that is, is, is some kind of deed or some kind of omission, like when somebody should have done something and they didn't, or when they shouldn't have done something and they did do something. So a deed or an omission or words that hurt. That's mainly how offense comes. We get a sense of this being a part of this, this journey of, uh, of reconciliation back in Colossians chapter 1, right after what we just read. In verse 21, Paul says, And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. That's, that's, that's offense. He's saying that that beautiful picture of glorious Jesus, that we offended him. And that's why there's division. So offense is one thing that causes division. It's true of us and God. It's true of our horizontal relationships. The second thing is misunderstanding. So we've got offense causes division, and misunderstanding does as well. And misunderstanding, I think, can take lots of different forms and come from a lot of different places. It could be because of ignorance, uh, that, that misunderstanding can come from prejudice. 
misunderstanding can come from misinformation. Wherever it comes from, when there is misunderstanding, the, the lack of accurate understanding, it, it, it breeds or it leads to division. We see some examples of this uh, that we'll get maybe a little bit more specific with here in a minute, if we have time. Uh, in the next chapter of Colossians, in Colossians chapter 2, Paul is continuing on, he's building this argument for what it looks like to, to have a, a theology that knows God, knows Jesus, and then sees that in, going into action to be ambassadors of reconciliation, peacemakers in our world. He's, he's kind of building this argument of these dynamics for this church, um, the Colossian church. And so in verse 4 of chapter 2, he says, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. So he's warning against a misunderstanding that would cause division. And then if we skip down to verse 8, he says, See to it that no one takes you captive by empty deceitful philosophies or by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. So these are all he's pointing, he's given some examples of misinformation, misunderstanding, of contrary ideas that when they don't fit up, it leads to division. And so we need to understand that. And so this is where I want to build, uh, begin building the diving board out of Philemon uh, to launch us into something important. Because one of the biggest areas, I believe, of misinformation and misunderstanding that causes division, particularly division that is plaguing our current culture, I think it's around the idea of what we can call worldview. Worldview. And there's a really interesting contrast in posture that Paul has in Colossians, what we just read, and Philemon that I think helps teach us a lesson about worldview. So in Colossians, we're going to kind of bounce back and forth a little bit now. In Colossians chapter 1, we read the first part of verse 21 where he talks about um, the uh, the offense that we have against God, and then he contrasts that very explicitly with the good news of Jesus Christ or the gospel or the big R reconciliation. All those idea are, ideas are kind of um, uh, somewhat synonymous. So let's read it again in verse 21 and now also verse 22. He says, And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled, Jesus has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above, and above reproach before him. And then he goes on. So he's outlining the gospel right here to the Colossians. And he, he does this in a number of ways throughout the letter. One of the things that makes Philemon unique is he doesn't do that. It's the only letter that Paul wrote where he doesn't outline the specifics of the gospel, of the good news, of this big R reconciliation. And so we have this curious contrast between those two things, Paul's kind of posture in these two letters, and I think that part of the explanation is, the, is around this idea of worldview. So in Philemon, this is is about as close as we get to it. Uh, he, he, he references different things, but in his ask to Philemon, I'm going to read in verse, let's see, which one is it? I'll start in verse 8. Actually, I'll back up in 7 because it gives us a little bit of ethos. It says, For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because of the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake, and the word for love in that instance is agape, and so it is, it is this defi uh, divine, rather uh, selfless expression of love. He says, for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. 
I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner, also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. And then jump down to verse 17. He says, to kind of conclude this part of his ask, he says, So if you consider me your partner, and partner there is, is koinonia, it's a special Greek word that means a, a sharing, a, a community, a communion over something, a partaking in the same thing. So he says, if we are partners in this faith, receive Onesimus as you would receive me. So what Paul alludes to is the unity that they have in Jesus Christ because of the big R reconciliation. What he doesn't say is he doesn't outline all of those things. He just examples in himself what it is that Jesus did for us. Paul posits himself between Onesimus and Philemon to say, treat him like you would treat me. He is modeling what the gospel says that Jesus did. Jesus, in his flesh, who knew no sin, became sin to reconcile the imperfect with the perfect. Jesus says to God, receive this one. Receive Jason like you would receive me, Jesus, your son. So Paul, does, he doesn't make it explicit. He's, he's exampling this principle. And so I think part of the contrast of making explicit in Colossians to the broadest audience and then exampling and not needing to make it explicit in Philemon is because the, uh, the, the dominant worldview among the recipients of Philemon, they, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was homogeneous. It was, it was together. It was the same looking at Jesus, understanding the big R reconciliation. Whereas in the letter to the Colossians, Paul does not assume that it has that kind of continuity. So there, he gets specific about things that would cause division. And we read a moment ago in verse, uh, in verse 8, how he, he listed off some things. And many scholars see the specific things that he listed off there as corresponding to dominant worldviews that are still um, alive today and, and are, are the dominant worldviews outside of Christianity in our world today. For example, when Paul says, uh, warns them against the empty deceit of philosophy, people see that as, as lining up quite well with this idea of, of secular humanism or this school of thought, this worldview that drives much of the humanities. And then when he says, when he talks about human tradition, a lot of people will see that as fairly synonymous with social sciences. When he talks about the elemental spirits, which he re-references in other places as well, it kind of lines up with what we could call a materialism or a naturalism. And then if you were to peek down in verse four, uh, 15 uh, of uh, Colossians chapter 2, he references these, that, that part of the work of Jesus disarms rulers and authorities, uh, putting them to open shame by triumphing, uh, triumphing over them. And so here, he, it's like he's giving a nod to other forms of spiritualism, which would include pantheism. And we'll explain those in a little bit, I think. Um, but let me back up and say, uh, what is a worldview? So if those things that I just mentioned, and we'll mention again, if those are dominant worldviews, what is a worldview? Some of you may not be familiar with that term. Well, the dictionary would say it is a comprehensive conception or apprehension of the world, especially from a specific standpoint. Here's my definition, which hopefully will be a little bit more helpful. A worldview is the beliefs, values, assumptions, and collective experiences that form your view of the world. So in some ways, a worldview is the lens 
that you primarily view and interpret the world around you. We could maybe say that this, the, your worldview is, is kind of the, the, the water that, that the fish swims in. It's, it's your water. And you're not always aware of that. And in some ways, worldview is nuanced to the individual. But in many ways, there are categorical worldviews that we can kind of define. There are whole areas of, of study around this stuff that, that, that recognize these dominant worldviews that drive how people interact with the world. And so here's the problem. So the, while there is some overlap in these worldviews, many things about them are incongruous. And so it's going to breed misunderstanding, and misunderstanding causes division. Furthermore, most people are relatively unaware of their worldview, or, or at best, they're marginally aware of it. And so then, they're not even bringing an awareness of their worldview into issues or conversations where someone else is not aware of theirs, and so it just heightens the level of misunderstanding and oftentimes is heightening the level of division. But in any case, generally, even to the degree that we're aware of our worldview, we are ill-equipped to converse across worldviews. And so this just causes division and division and confusion and difficulty, particularly difficulty in finding Little our reconciliation. And thus we have little peace. Well, when I say all of those things, if I had to guess, most people listening, there is at least a little part of that that intellectually you're like, yeah, it makes sense. And you're kind of ready to move on. You just want to sort of intellectually accept, yeah, different worldviews. It makes it hard to have a conversation. Sure. Uh, So what's next? But I I don't want to move on too far because I want it to be more than just um, understanding the point that I'm making. And I want you to really get it. I want want you to be able to hang some uh, emotive uh, uh, value on it. I want it to kind of burn in your memory a little bit. So I thought of an analogy that I think can help us understand the significance of this truth of different worldviews. Uh, so I'm going to put up uh, some figures on the screen, and I just want you to think about what these figures represent. So here's the first one. So two figures right there. You would be correct that it is a one and a zero. And so I would just ask you, what, is, what does that mean? Most people, they see it, and they say, well, it means ten. And you would kind of be right. It, it, it could be 10, but it actually means 16. And, I, and I'm not tr- trying to trick you. Like that, what you're looking at right there on the screen, it means 16. Let me show you another one. All right, you see that there? A1C, what does that mean? Well, if you are really clever or from the East Coast, you might think that it's the beginning of the postal code for St. John's, Newfoundland. But it's not. It is actually, if we were to translate it, it's the number 2,588. And if you don't believe me, let me show you the method to reconcile A1C to, which, which you may not quite understand, to 2,588, which is something maybe that you do understand. Here, here is the method for reconciliation. Take a look. Do you like, you like that? I mean, probably most of you could figure out what to do with that, uh, but each of those parentheses actually represent A, 1, C. What this is, and many of you will know this, this is hexadecimal sort of math language. So the, 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 the 10 in hexadecimal is not actually 10. We 
kind of conceptualize it because we have a numerical framework, aka worldview, that sees it as this 10 base. So we see one zero and we think 10. But if you were, if you were fluent in hexadecimal, when you see one zero, you would see 16. And when you see A1C, you would actually see A1C. Your brain wouldn't try to go get a postal code. Your brain wouldn't need a formula to turn it into a 10 base number. It just, it's, it's a hexadecimal figure. Here's another one. Now, some of y'all are just like, I'm not even going to try. I don't know what that one is. Is it, is it 1,000? Is it some algorithm? Well, actually, it, it's, it's eight. You see, this one is binary. One, zero, zero, zero is, is a whole nother way of representing. And so here's a little chart that I want to just briefly put up there for you. So take a look at this chart that can hopefully fill in some gaps. Um, as you're looking at that, you can kind of follow down and you can see where uh, you, get to, you get to nine in the hexadecimal and instead of rolling into a two-digit number, it goes to A. And so all of these things in the different columns in the chart there, they're each somewhat synonymous with their own worldview. They're using common figures that we all recognize but they mean different things. And to mean something different doesn't mean that it's wrong. So this is, this is important because unlike different spoken languages or, or written languages, where it is, it is very intuitive that we need a translator. When you're talking about figures and, and, and mathematics like we were just looking at, it's not as obvious and that's what worldview is like. Worldview takes the same world, it's the same, same view, the same matter, the same energy, the same words for things, whatever linguistically we represent. It's the same world, but it puts the pieces together very, very differently. And so the, the mere existence of different worldviews guarantees that we're going to have disagreements and conflict. But part of the hard work that we have got to do is that we have got to grow more comfortable with the lack of comfort, the discomfort that comes from clashing systems. Many of you, I know, when, when the formula to translate hexadecimal math uh, in that instance to, to something that we're more familiar with came up there, there's like a low-level panic that kind of is triggered. And, and you're like, uh, I don't know what this is. Can I stop listening? Like, can I click on another tab? Or where's the mutant money? It, we, 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 there's a certain amount of discomfort. And I want you to know that that's okay. That's okay. And knowing that begins to tool us to have conversations that have a hope for that little R reconciliation. And speaking quite frankly as a Christian, it is my belief that those conversations and pursuits of little R reconciliation, when done authentically, often are how God uses people to open doors for His spiritual truth to come in to teach about big R reconciliation. Not that we need to fo force it or be in charge of it, but that these ideas are very much tied. And so here's where I want to go here and begin to land the plane. Uh, I'm going to have to make sure I go quickly through this next uh, point, and, and hopefully that you can just do some homework uh, to fill in the gaps, whether I misspeak or whether I leave something out. But we're going to turn now to the importance of understanding worldviews. Uh, specifically in reconciliation. Hopefully this, this hexadecimal analogy will give you a little bit more to sink your teeth into in, in how this is a real thing because the conversations that we're having with many of the people in our lives are on that level of different, different levels of math, trying to make sense of the same numbers. And so we've got to understand that that dynamic is in play in our relationships every day. So to do that, I want to repoint out those, the, some of those dominant worldviews to you so that you can kind of see how it makes sense that they would be 
it would be hard to have unity, hard to have productive conversations, and then we'll talk about what to do about it. So here are, here are the, the dominant worldviews that I mentioned. The first is secular humanism. And, and some of the basics in this are uh, the idea that, that, quote, man makes himself. So much of our individualistic uh, societies is built around this idea that what's good for you is good for you, what's good for me is good for me. That humankind can, can put the pieces together, we can enlighten ourselves, we can study and we can do all of these things such that we begin to kind of define our reality. We have the power and the right to do that. In secular humanism, good and truth aren't really spoken of very much because they matter less because they are relative, because each person or group defines their own norms and meanings to a large degree. And so you have all sorts of different philosophies that branch up from this where where we essentially are, are making our own rules according to what we think or what we feel. Next one that I'll be very quick, quick in the overview is material naturalism. And this essentially says that the only things that exist are, are matter, energy, laws, and processes. It's the natural world. The things that we can essentially touch or, or observe interacting, this is the world, the material stuff of the world. And so, really, our pursuit as humans is just to know as much as possible about these things. And the more we know, the better we get. And one day, we will know everything and can conclusively rule that there is no God. We can finally explain it. We'll know enough about the material world that we won't need the silly idea of God anymore. John Lennox is a, a, a great a great speaker and, and a great mind. Uh, he, this is a paraphrase of something that he has said about this idea. And he says it's a little bit like knowing everything about the internal combustion engine and therefore concluding that Henry Ford didn't exist. And so there's some problems inherent in this worldview, even though there are a lot of wonderful things about the processes within the worldview. Scientific method, experimentation, observing and noticing our world, they're all fantastic. But some of the problems come in when we realize that there aren't moral problems in this framework, that that in this worldview, all moral problems ultimately are biological problems. And so they're treated as such. And I know far too many people whose wrestling with the ills that plague them mentally, emotionally, physically. While there is a place, a very valid place for medicine, that, they're, that the, the, the real battle and the real freedom for them happens on, a, on, on an additional plane. That, that there is something about the spiritual existence, something about moral questions, something about the big questions of life, that material naturalism just can't quite grapple with, falls short. Another one is pantheism, and I've got to move quickly here. Pantheism, in short, is that it's kind of this idea that God is everything and everything is God. It, it can lend to different forms of general spiritualism or adopting many kinds of gods to, to represent this, this pantheistic idea. And the strength in this one is that it acknowledges the relevance of spiritual beings. I think that it's, it's part of what, if you let it, will point to the validity of the Christian worldview uh, in, in the fact that the other worldviews, where they fall short, the tendency is for people to kind of build this patchwork version that borrows from components from other worldviews to try to make a cohesive worldview. And so in pantheism, we have these elements of, spiritual, uh, of spirituality that I think people want, they desire to, to, to kind of patch up their worldview, but obviously it, it can lead to some dangerous things, certainly from a, a Christian worldview where, where the biblical Christian worldview doesn't, it doesn't need anything else. It's, it's cohesive in itself and it, it, exp- and it explains spiritual beings quite, quite well. 
And so if we take, even take that part out of it, which has happened a lot in the course of the church, where spirituality has even, uh, miraculous things have been tried to graft out of uh, Christianity, it, it, it leads to some problems and then ends up needing to, be, to get stuff stuck on. And, and the worldview kind of becomes a, a bit of its own kind of patchwork and is not the biblical Christianity that I would, that I would put forward to you. All right, let's, let, let's begin to wrap up here. Part of, part of what I want to make sure that you understand about the, the relevance of worldviews is that they all start with different kinds of faith claims. And so whatever it is, there's, there's some kind of faith claim that kind of sets it up and sets it off and gets it moving. It's this baseline for interpreting the world. And in many places, these, over, these worldviews overlap with Christianity. And I think this is valuable to notice because um, we, in the Christian worldview, we would say that, that God is the creator, that the evil one can only distort and manipulate. So it would make sense that really there's nothing particularly new about any of these other worldviews outside of biblical Christianity. If anything, there's sort of a, a, a distortion or a, a, a sidebar in some ways. They try to add something uh, and, and they end up not being quite coherent all the way through. And so only a biblical Christianity, only biblical Christianity provides a fully coherent, unifying understanding of existence that can both validate the rationality and the other worldviews. It doesn't have to say they have nothing to offer. It can validate that, but actually extends the rationality to a, a, a higher place beyond them of a more holistic, beautiful view of the world and what's beyond it. But of course, not everyone believes that this is true, at least not yet. We believe that there will be a day when Jesus comes back and all things are revealed for what they are. But for now, not everybody believes this to be true, and that's, that's where we begin to have these conversations, where all of a sudden, these worldviews are intersecting and we're having to navigate them. We're having these, uh, these hexadecimal conversations with folks and everything begins to kind of go sideways. And so here's, here's, here's how I want to point you towards application uh, for these things. One of the beautiful subtexts of Philemon is that Paul is asking Philemon, yes, Paul is asking Philemon in the church to do something completely radical as it compares to the worldview dominating the area. The Roman mindset, the Roman worldview would only have harsh judgment for Onesimus. Or maybe, maybe there would be some level of mercy that could be afforded him as he comes back and resumes his position in the structure of, of the household but what Paul is calling for here is to be more than just merciful on a slave. He is calling to receive them as family. This is radically counter to the Roman worldview. And I would submit to you that that shift is only possible through the kind of transformation that Jesus brings where our view of the world is now viewed through his eyes. And that is what is revealed to us through the pages of the Bible. So the, the application really is that we are in a position to love others like that, where we can be counter to the, the kinds of worldviews that are causing division. That our worldview can be different, but not necessarily divide in ways that are, are harmful. So let me, let me summarize some things and we'll wrap up. Educate yourself about different worldviews and how they stack up, how they compare. Educate yourself about these things. I can't fit it into 45 or 50 minutes on how to, how to equip you. You've got to engage. You've got to learn about the water that you're swimming in. You've got to understand about these worldviews so you can see where you have accidentally begun to, to lean into one that is, that is false. It's not, it's not consistent with, with Jesus. 
Educate yourself. Next one, learn helpful ways of articulating the strength of the Christian worldview over all others. Learn to articulate your worldview. And so that even, if you're watching, you're just sort of checking out this, you, you stumbled upon this, or you're, you're, you're kind of journeying with us as a church, but you're not sure where you stand with Jesus, learn to articulate your worldview. You've got to understand what it is so that you can test it. See if it's what you want to stand on in regards to eternity. Learn how to articulate your worldview. Next one is practice. Practice diffusing your surprise when conversations get emotional. Our culture has gotten so terrible, so terrible at this. It's like when, when division happens in a conversation, when we can't agree and, and there's this emotional spike, just everything breaks loose. We've got to practice diffusing our surprise that conversations get heated, that, com- that the, the divisions arise. We've got to remind ourselves that oftentimes the offense or the misunderstanding uh, is, is what's at the root of it. That really it doesn't have to be a big deal. That we just got to dig and figure out what it is and then we can kind of talk about it together. Here's the next one. Share. Sharing our faith. Actually, I don't know if I gave this one or not. Sharing our faith is akin to hexadecimal math for people, uh, particularly folks who, who haven't been tracking with the Christian worldview. And this is important for us to realize. So next time you have a conversation with a friend or a loved one, and you bring up something about your faith, and it seems to trigger their fight-or-flight syndrome, understand that that's just because you effectively brought up hexadecimal math. And they're kind of freaking out because it's different. And it doesn't quite mesh with their worldview. And so show some grace. Be like, okay, yeah, it it makes sense. Maybe we can back up and and figure out where we kind of got off track. We can kind of diffuse. Next one is learn and practice communication skills so that we can have more productive conversations across worldviews. And really, you could take worldviews out of that sentence and place just about anything. I mean, I walk with enough uh, families and married people and hoping to be married people to know that our communication skills need some work. And so consider this me giving you a little gentle shove to go do some work. We can recommend, I'll recommend a book right now. Crucial Conversations is a great book on communication. It, it is worth the read, or at least a conversation with me about it. Uh, Jason.byers at celebrationchurch.ca. Let's talk about it because we need to learn and practice communication skills. And the last one, pray for and practice embodying reconciliation. I'm, I'm talking about what Paul did here. Pray for and practice embodying reconciliation like Paul I want us to pray that this will happen, and I want us to look for opportunities where God is enabling that koinonia between an us and other people, this partnership, this, this uh, opportunity to, to commune together, be partakers in something special where we can have little our reconciliation. And then, Lord willing, that he would pour his spirit into that and bless it with all kinds of blessings that come from the big R reconciliation. Pray for that to happen. Look for ways to embody reconciliation. Our world desperately needs it. Let's pray. God, help us love our enemies. I've preached a long time today, but I hope that you will make it matter. Not because there's anything of value in my words, but because we have thousands of years of track record where biblical Christianity has blessed the world. Where counterfeit versions of Christianity have brought pain, but where Jesus is our unity. And the big R reconciliation that he brings us spills over into peace and hope and joy and love. Things that we desperately, desperately need. 
So God, help us. Help us love our enemies. Help us hang in there in emotional conversations. Help us do the hard work of equipping ourselves. Don't let us escape all the time into entertainment or whatever else might quell the thirst for something more. Quench it. Father, let us be a little more okay with discomfort and then through it that you would help us be persons of peace. And that you would glorify yourself because of it and that you would introduce more people to Jesus and the big R reconciliation that he provides. Amen. foes are many they rise against me but I will hold my ground I will not fear the war I will not fear the storm my help is on the way my help is on the way and oh my God he will not delay my refuge and strength always I will not fear His promise is true My God will come through always always Trouble surrounds me, chaos abounding, my soul will rest in you. I will not fear the war, I will not fear the storm, my help is on the way, my help is on the way, and oh my God. Delay my refuge and strength always. I will not fear, His promise is true. My God will come through always, always. His promise is true, 
my God will come through always, always. clouds a strange and lovely sound I hear it in the thunder and the rain it's ringing in the sky like cadence in the night but the music of the universe plays singing you are holy great and mighty the moon and the stars declare who you are i'm so unworthy but still you love me forever my heart will sing of how great you are beautiful and free the song of galaxies Reaching far beyond the Milky Way Let's join in with the sound Come on, let's sing it loud It's the music of the universe plays We're singing, you are holy Great and mighty The moon and the stars Thank you for that moment, Jesus. Moments where we can sing your praise from across the city, from across the country, and know how powerful your spirit is with us. So Jesus, we pray that our praise would continue 
this morning as we go out and we we think critically of our worldview and how we can translate and how we can share of this this powerful presence presence that has spoken to us today and that we will commune with tomorrow holy god we thank you for your holiness holy god we thank you for your powerful presence that you are good that you are with us we ask that you bless us as we continue through this week amen Thank you for joining us. We'll catch you again next week. Feel free to always be communicating with us throughout the week as well. This is not just a Sunday to Sunday thing. We don't just check that email Saturday night. Info at celebrationchurch.ca. There's a prayer email as well. And then Jason mentioned his email earlier today. Looking forward to hearing from you.